Hello out there, you're watching everything you need to know about Mage Knight board game. We are completely done explaining all the rules. We've explained the training scenario called the First Reconnaissance, and now we are looking at map shapes. I want to be clear that we've explained everything in the rule book at this point. You know all the mechanics, and so you can play the game. One quick thing about Mage Knight board game, this is not just a game, it's a game system which means the objective and the way you play is determined by you. Now you know how to play the cards and how to use the mana and everything else. I'm just going to show you how to assemble a map. Here's what I'm looking for in a map. We have this starting tile here, which is side A, and the other side is side B. You'll notice that the construction of this deck is that there's a coastline going this way and this way. So ideally, when you build from here, you're going to start here, and at the beginning of the game you'll have two tiles here. We have countryside tiles, which have a green back, and we have core tiles, which have a brown back. There are eight core tiles. Four of them do not have a city in the middle. These are non-city core tiles, and four of them do have a city in the middle. Those are core tiles, or city core tiles. They are white, green, blue, and red, obviously. We have 11 country tiles here for a total of 20 tiles altogether. At the beginning of the game you're going to shuffle this up. You're not just going to have uh, the tiles in order of 1 through 11. That's only in the first reconnaissance. So you're going to draw the first two tiles at random and as it turns out we have tile 8 and tile 7. Again, these could have been just about anything. And then at the start of the game, you'll say, oh, I have a monastery. You'll draw an advanced action and not put it in the advanced action offer. You'll put it in the unit offer. If nobody visits this monastery or if nobody uses that advanced action during the round, then you will eliminate it and replenish it when you replenish the unit offer. If somebody does learn this advanced action, you don't replenish it until the beginning of the next round. You'd put orc marauder tokens here and here. You'd put a yellow advanced or Ancient Ruins token here, and then you'd be ready to play. By now you should know all the features on the map. Now when you get to this area here, you will explore, and now you're going to go three tiles. You're not going to go to this lake space, but you could be here, and there's probably only one way you could explore. But if you were here, you could explore in either direction. So you have to, in that event, explain which direction you're going to explore. Or you can say, I use move four to explore two different tiles, and then declare if you're going left first or right first. That is important. So at this point, you would put down three more tiles, like so, and make sure that they are oriented the right way. Again, circles have to meet circles, squ uh, stars have to meet stars, and the numbers have to be right side up. Okay, so now we have... Two tiles, three tiles. And as you can see, this is going to extend out in like a triangle form. So we'd put four up here and five up here. Now, eventually, we're going to run out of countryside tiles, and you're going to have to start exploring core side tiles. Remember, at the beginning of every round, after you've explored at least one core side tile, or at least one core side tile on the map, that when you put out the unit offer, you're going to alternate between elite units and regular units. There are two rules to keep in mind when it comes to assigning new tiles. The first one is if it's a countryside tile, it has to be adjacent to at least two other tiles. Or it has to be adjacent to a tile that's adjacent to two other tiles. So, for example, I could explore this way. This is legal. I can go here if I want to. Okay. Notice this tile is only adjacent to one other tile. However, the tile it's adjacent to is adjacent to two other tiles. So if I were to explore again, I could explore here or here and fill in this gap, but I couldn't just keep going in a straight line. I'd have to make sure that the next tile is adjacent to two tiles, even if this is one of those tiles. I can't just make this adjacent to this tile, because this is only adjacent to one tile. If it's a core tile, it can only be adjacent to two tiles. You can't, you can't follow the same rule where this is adjacent to one tile and not the other. Now, looking at this coastline, you can see an imaginary plane. 
and you can see how this this coastline is going to continue indefinitely along this plane. So for example, the coastline's here, here, next it would be here, and so on, it would extend this way. When you explore quartiles, they cannot be on the coastline. The reason for that is because eventually you would have two cities, and if they happen to both be on the coastline way out here, they'd be too far apart. So the rule is that they can't be on the coastline. Now, that means they can't be here or here. However, it doesn't mean they can't be on the end. They just can't be along this imaginary plane here, if that makes sense. So that's what a wedge map looks like. This map is good, by the way, in the training scenario for as many players, up to four players. And in a regular game, it's good for about two to three players. Depends how comfortable you are, depends on their experience level. It's going to be crowded, there's going to be some interaction, and you're going to have players going after the same map features. But with a small group, it should be okay. Your other option is to flip this tile over and start on side B. You'll notice that we kind of cut up here on the coastline, but now we've explored out this way. So you could put another tile here, which is the reason that this tile is designed like this. With tile B, we're going to start with three different tiles, like this. So, that's the starting map. At the beginning of the game, we're going to put a keep face down. If a player moves in any number of spaces this way, we'll immediately flip this up so they have visibility. We will put an uh, Ancient Ruins token down, a yellow token. We'll draw an Advanced Action card and put it in the unit offer. We will put out Orc Marauder tokens here and here. And we'll put another Ancient Ruins token here. Now, there are a few different options for a map. This is called an open map, either a limited open or a fully open map. The first thing you can do is make it an open map with three columns. To do that, you are simply going to fill in the columns like this. Again, making sure that the circles meet circles, stars meet stars, etc. Okay, so now as you can see, this is continuing this way, but there are only three columns, so this is going to go in a straight line. Okay, if I were to explore three more tiles, they'd be like this. And I'm just extending the same pattern without going any further in the left or the right, so like that, okay? So this is going to continue for three columns. This is also good for two to three players. It's a little open for two, but three players will be able to move around the map and not be too much in each other's way. It could be a little bit crowded for four. Your other option is to have an open map limited to four columns. That means you still start with these three, but now once you've expanded past this point, you could have a fourth tile here, like so. And then you can continue exploring this way And you get the idea. You keep going, and you now have four columns going across instead of three. Uh, your other option would be to take advantage of this area, and you could explore a fifth column, which would make this a fully open map. A fully open map meaning that there are now three, ti three tiles in the first row, and then five tiles after that going forward. This is good if you have four players because it gives you a lot of room to roam around. Okay, It's not good if you have two or three players because then it's just too vast and it's, it's impossible to, to keep track of all, all that's going on. 
uh, you're not going to have any interaction, and it's going to be hard for, especially in a cooperative scenario, to get to this city if one player's here and one player's here. Uh, it's not going to work. It's good for four players, and it gives them a lot of room to roam around without an inexperienced player feeling left out. So those are the different maps I'll be talking about in each different scenario. You could use a wedge for this one, or open map limited to three columns, or four columns, or fully open columns. Uh, it's just your own personal preference. So you have to decide how you want to do it. Another thing I wanted to talk about, again, was dummy player. I think I mentioned this before talking about solo games. I'm going to be talking about scenarios and saying that you're going to be using a dummy player. So I want to explain how that works again really quickly. I'm going to use Tovox deck. What we do with the dummy player, if we have one, and we'll use one in solo or cooperative games, is have the player's deck of cards. There's 18 cards here. The hero card, skill disruption card, and then the 16 card basic deck. This gets shuffled up. Remember, Tovok's favorite colors are blue and then red in that order. So you're going to take two blue crystals and a red crystal here, shuffle this up and put it face down. You'll draw tactics for both yourself and the dummy player, and depending on the scenario, you, you'll do it in a certain order, and you may actually dispose of yours or the dummy player's or both tactics at the end of the round. But what you'll do is, using the tactics to determine player order, when it's time for the dummy player to take a turn, you can turn over three cards. And I turned over a blue card, which means I would turn two more cards over. And then I stop there. On a turn, if I turn three cards over, and the third one happens to be red. Let's just say that this red card, Rage, was the last card. He has one crystal here. You're only going to draw one more card. Okay. At the start of the dummy player's turn, if his deed deck is empty, then he declares end of round. That just means he doesn't take a turn. The solo player, or the other three players in a cooperative game, two to three players, take one more turn, and then the round's over. Okay? That's how Dummy Player works. At the end of the round, when you replenish the Advanced Actions offer, you take the bottom card from the Advanced Action deck, or from the offer, put it in the Dummy Player's deck, and shuffle it in. So now he has one more card to draw through during his turn, during each round. You're going to take one crystal that is the same color as the bottom card in the spell offer and put that in his inventory. So when you, when you draw a card of that color, you're going to draw one more card. That's to kind of keep balance. And again, you have some control when you pick advanced actions and spells of what color crystals and what color cards there are. So keep that in mind as you're doing your level ups that you want to make sure you're not letting the dummy player flip through his deck too quickly. I also want to say that especially in the first couple times that you're playing, you don't want to use the dummy player if you feel like you just want to be able to take your time, no pressure, no stress, and play a game. The dummy player is just there to make sure that the game is not taken forever in a day. Or that you're not rushing through it too quickly. It's just there as a timer. That's the only purpose of it. Uh, the other option is, I also forgot to mention with the dummy player, you're going to have the skills. You're going to have a stack of skills and when you level up and draw your skill, you're going to put one of the dummy player skills in the common skills offer and you'll be able to use that on a later round. Uh, there's also a variant involving teams. If you're playing this game with teams, what you do is take out the interactive skill. Again, that's the one with the black silhouetted head on it. Uh, understand that that, that skill is not going to affect your fellow player. If you put it out there and it's something that happens at the end of your turn that affects other players, it does not affect your teammate. Uh, if you have spells 17 through 20, the interactive ones, though, they do affect your, your teammate. Uh, you're not able to trade things like crystals and cards and things like that, and each player has to take his or her own turn. Uh, however, you're going to do cooperative city assaults where you're both considered suitable heroes to get to the city and attack. Uh, you can have table talk and plan things out when you're doing that. You're not going to be doing PvP combat. And also, you can enter a keep that's owned by another player and you can recruit units there uh, assuming that's your teammate Okay, uh, when you're in the keep or adjacent to it your hand limits increased 
but only for the keeps that have your shield token. If you're in your teammate's keep and you don't own any keeps, it does not modify your hand limit. Also, when you score, you're going to go with the base score, which is the player with lowest fame. And then for the achievements, you're only going to score the higher score of both players in the area. And for the greatest beating, you're only going to score the player that got the most fame reduced, the, the most wounds in hand. And then you assign uh, titles as usual. Greatest knowledge, greatest loot, greatest adventure, greatest conqueror, greatest leader, greatest beating. So uh, it's important to keep that in mind and make sure that you have team concepts. I think that's pretty much everything before we get into the various scenarios. So come in next time for everything you need to know about Mage Knight board game. Again, at this point, you have everything you need. Uh, you already know how to assault city, so you can make your stack of tiles however you want to, remembering to put your city tile or your core tiles down with your city tiles shuffled in, your countryside tiles on top, and when you draw the city, you put the city figure there, set it to the level that you want to. You're going to go there and fight the enemies there, and that's the game. But decide how you want to play that. I'm going to come back next time with some recommended scenarios from the rule book. So I'll see you again here very shortly. Until then, GLHF. Good luck. Have fun.